in the book of Hebrews. We'll be in Hebrews chapter 8. You could turn there in your Bibles. Uh, Hebrews chapter 8. Uh, let's pray while you turn there. Lord, thank you. Thank you for what you've done for us. Thank you for your word. And thank you for just being here with us. We know you are in this room. For you reside within us. And Lord, we don't take that for granted, but we invite you in. We ask you to be in control. And Lord, may we be able to focus on what it is you want to say to us today, regardless of the words that are spoken. May you be the one that speaks to our hearts. We love you, Lord Jesus. Be glorified in our lives, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So, in this section of the book of Hebrews, well, it really began in Hebrews chapter 6, as the writer began to expound on his thoughts regarding the superior nature of the high priest that we have in Jesus Christ. And he was comparing that to the priesthood that we had through the Aaronic line, through the Levites. And with the Hebrew believers struggling under persecution and pressure, pressure, they were questioning whether or not Jesus was enough for them to truly be right with God. Did they need to add Judaism on to Christianity so that they would be more saved? Or did they just need to chuck it all and go back to Judaism? They needed to be corrected, they needed to be encouraged, they needed to be strengthened, and that is what the writer of Hebrews was working painstakingly through this letter to convey. And as such, he gave them an anchor that they could hold on to, a place where they could rest their faith. When back in chapter 6, verse 17 through 20, he said, Thus God, determining to show more abundantly to the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel, confirmed it by an oath, that by two immutable things in which it is impossible for God to lie, we might have strong consolation, who have fled for refuge to lay hold of the hope set before us. This hope we have as an anchor of the soul, both sure and and steadfast, and which enters the presence behind the veil, where the forerunner has entered for us, even Jesus, having become high priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. So he told us we have two immutable things. We went over it last week, immutable. It means fixed, unchangeable, unalterable, cannot be transposed, cannot be transferred. So the anchor of our hope is found in two things, a promise and an oath, both of which are immutable, fixed, and unchanging. Our hope and our faith rest on Jesus Christ and his nature and his character. It is the person of Christ that all Christian faith rests and hopes and lasts. Not only has he made promises, but he has himself demonstrated them. He has fulfilled them. He has completed them, and he will continue to do so. He alone is our hope. And if this is true, then our faith will be strengthened as we see more clearly the character of the one with whom we have to deal. And that's why the author moved on to bring up again the high priesthood of Melchizedek like we went over last week, comparing it to the priesthood of the Levites. Now the argument of his comparison is very simple. He points out that the Levitical priests derived their authority by descent from Abraham. Yet Abraham acknowledged the supremacy of Melchizedek by paying tithes to him. And it was a really confusing passage when you just read through it. But as we went over last week, we could see that the help available in the Levitical priests was by comparison incomplete. It was secondary. It was limited. It was temporary. The sacrifices were repeated continually as they were a temporary picture of the permanent solution. And even though the help was real help, it was only to a degree, only within limit. It only went so far. That is the argument of the writer here. Just how far is revealed when he shows that the ministry of Jesus supersedes the law. And not only did the ministry of Jesus supersede the law, but he also shows that it is superior in greatness to the priesthood of old. And his ministry fulfilling the incompleteness, fulfilling the temporary nature of the law, and that Jesus himself surpasses all that any human priest could ever do. He surpasses it all. 
by he himself becoming the guarantee of the promise, the surety of the promise. In chapter 7, verse 22, it says, By so much more Jesus has become a surety of a better covenant. Also, there were many priests because they were prevented by death from continuing. But he, because he continues forever, has an unchangeable priesthood. Therefore, he is also able to save to how far? To the uttermost. He is also able to save to the uttermost those who come to God through him, since he always lives to make intercession for them. For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sin, and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. Verse 28 says, For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness. But the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the Son who has been perfected forever. We have a high priest who is holy, who is harmless, who is undefiled, who is separate from sinners, who has become higher than the heavens. No longer do we, we require any intermediary no intermediary that is fault-filled as we are, but we have one who is perfect in all his ways. And from there, the writer of Hebrews gets to what he calls the main point of the things that he has been discussing over the last couple of chapters. So let's stand as we read together through Hebrews chapter 8, verse 1 through 13. Hebrews chapter 8. It says this. Now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected, and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest, since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, See that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which is established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel, with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand to lead them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant. And I disregarded them, says the Lord. For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my laws in their, in their mind and write them on their hearts. I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to the, their unrighteousness and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Lord, thank you again for your word. Speak to our hearts this morning, I pray. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, you may be seated. Now part of the beauty of the book of Hebrews is that the writer simply cannot take his eyes off of Jesus Christ. But he keeps him firmly fixed on our Savior. He's writing to these Hebrew believers who were really struggling under the weight of persecution and under the weight of pressure. They were being harassed by others and confused by false doctrine and were being tempted by all of it to drift away from the anchor that they had been given. Now last week as we went through chapter 7 near the end, we saw how he encouraged them that our great high priest was absolutely the perfect fit for them. In chapter 7, verse 26, he said, For such a high priest was fitting for us, who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens. Christ was just what they needed. He was just who they needed. He is all that they needed. 
And because this is scripture, even though it's a letter written to first century believers who were struggling, the reality is it's also written to us here in the 21st century. It's still what we need to hear in these times we live in, where every foundation is being shaken and every foundation is being tested, where pressure is being induced by society to leave Jesus behind, where the doctrine we find in Scripture is being questioned and cherry-picked so that good is evil and evil is good. And just like those struggling believers, we need just as urgently as those first century believers to know the anchor of our faith our savior jesus christ is still the only anchor for our faith he's what we need he's who we need and he is all we need now between verses 26 and 27 of chapter 7 there's a major division in the letter you know the the chapter breaks aren't always where it's most ideal because the thoughts flow from one into another this was written as a letter you know, the writer of Hebrews didn't write down and give his greeting and go, you know, I'll call that verse one. And then go to the next thing. You know what? I think I'll call that verse two. I'm going to break it here. I got to go to lunch. I'll call the next thing I come to chapter two. You know, he wrote a letter to these people. We break it up into chapters and verses. And sometimes it's hard to get the con continuity, the flow of the letter. Because again, the chapters blend into each other. <clears throat> so now we covered those verses last week. But they tie to the beginning of our passage for today, verses 26 and 27 of chapter 7. As between those ver two verses, the writer turns from his discussion of the person of Jesus Christ, who he is, who he is, and why he's superior. And now he turns to the subject uh, in the next chapters of the work and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. In fact, the next three chapters focus on the work of the cross and, and on the sacrifice that hung there, pouring out his precious blood. Now, I've heard it said by another pastor that you will never understand Jesus Christ except in connection with his cross. And you will never understand the cross apart from the person of Christ. They're indivis indivisibly united. You cannot separate one from the other and still see the whole. The person of Jesus Christ and the work of Jesus Christ are inexorably linked. Without the person of Jesus Christ, there's no sacrifice worthy to be the work. Without the work of Jesus Christ, the person would not have bridged the gap of sin to bring us to redemption. It was necessary. The perfect manhood of Jesus Christ, God in flesh, coupled to be the perfect sacrifice of Jesus Christ. They go together. You will never understand Jesus Christ except in connection with his cross. And you will never understand the cross apart from the person of Christ. And that's where the writer of Hebrews is taking us. In chapter 8, we're going to see what the main point of all of this is. The answer begins to be found in the last three verses of chapter 7. And then rolls on into the first five verses of chapter 8. First he says this. He talks about the perfect sacrifice. Again, chapter 7, verse 26 through 28. Look at this. It says, For such a high priest was fitting for us who is holy, harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and has become higher than the heavens, who does not need daily as those high priests to offer up sacrifices, first for his own sin and then for the people's. For this he did once for all when he offered up himself. For the law appoints as high priests men who have weakness, but the word of the oath which came after the law appoints the son who's been perfected forever. Now join two phrases of that passage together and you get the main thought. That Jesus offered up himself and that Jesus was made perfect. As a priest, Jesus Christ could find no unblemished sacrifice that he could offer except himself. And so he offered himself. It was the only way. And as a sacrifice, there is found no other priest worthy of offering such a sacrifice. So Christ became that priest. It was the only way. Jesus Christ, both priest and sacrifice. Now, if you were here with us a few weeks ago on Good Friday, we read through much of what happened that day while Jesus hung there on the cross. And we saw what he said while he hung there. And if you look at it, he was both priest and sacrifice 
while he hung there on the cross, how do we see him as a priest there? Well, one of the first things he uttered was recorded to us by Luke in Luke 23, 34, where he looked at those that were busy putting him on that cross, throwing him down on that rugged cross against that rough wood, binding his wrists and his hands, you know, binding his ankles and his feet, and then nailing him with heavy spikes to that tree. And what did he say? Lord, send your angels and smite them all. No, it's not what he said. He said, Father, forgive them. They don't know not what they do. He knew they didn't understand. He's interceding for the ones who have nailed him to the tree. He was acting as a priest, an intermediator, a mediator for even those men that were nailing him to the cross. Luke also recorded how he interacted with one of the thieves that hung next to him. As he, as he turns to the thief at his side, and Luke 23, 43 tells us, and he gives him the promise, that thief that's hanging there, today you're going to be with me in paradise. He's ministering grace to this convicted criminal given the death sentence who in the process of watching Jesus hang on that cross recognized the reality of who and what Jesus really was doing. And as a result, he readily admitted his need. And he looked at Jesus and went, remember me when you come into your kingdom. Now, I'm sorry, but that's faith. You're hanging on a cross ready to die. And the guy you're saying, hey, would you remember me when you come into your kingdom is hanging there to die on the cross next to you. Well, in that moment, he saw the reality of it. You know, his kingdom isn't of this world. Where he's going, I don't know where it is, but that's where I want to be. He said, Lord, remember me when you come into your kingdom. And Jesus looked at him and said, today you'll be with me in paradise. He recognized that, and he gave that man comfort. He acted as a mediator for him, like a priest. Then to his mother and the disciple John, who were standing at the foot of the cross, he looked at Mary, and he said, Woman, behold your son. And in turn, he looked at John and said, Behold your mother. And still as a priest, he's ministering comfort to their hearts, giving one to the other to meet the need of life. But then soon after that, there came a moment where a change occurred. The sun was hidden, and a strange, unnatural darkness fell across the face of the land for three hours. And after that, the first words that came from the cross out of the midst of that darkness is the terrible cry of grief and despair of, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Now he's no longer a priest. He is the sacrifice, the offering, literally becoming sin, taking on all sin as the final, perfect sacrifice, satisfying the cost of all sin for all time. And then from the midst of that depth of pain and sorrow and anguish of spirit, Jesus said the words, I thirst. And it's followed by the last two cries from the cross. When the loud, with a loud voice at the end of the three hours, he shouted, it is finished. And then, Father, into your hands I commit my spirit. And immediately he breathed his last. And in those last words, he is still a sacrifice, having completed the work that the Father gave him to do. Being the perfect high priest, that offered himself as the perfect sacrifice and being the perfect sacrifice that only a perfect high priest was worthy of offering. And if you join the two phrases uh, of this passage together, you get a more complete thought of the writer here. Not only did Christ offer up himself as the perfect sacrifice, but we're told he did it once for all, forever. No longer a need for sacrifice. No longer any separation between God and mankind. One perfect sacrifice allowed for the veil in the temple to be torn from top to bottom by God himself. Do you realize that? After the sacrifice, God reached down and he opened the doorway for us. He rent the veil that guarded the holiest place of all things. So that mankind could enter in. The veil separating man from God was torn in two. All was complete. There was no longer any need for any separation between God and mankind. Don't you wonder what the priests were wondering in the temple when all of a sudden the the veil that covers the Holy of Holies is torn in two? And they're looking in to see, well, what's going to happen to us? You know? I wonder what they thought or what they went through. How many of them realized what was happening? No more sacrifice for the temporary satisfaction of sin, but now complete access to God. There was no need for any separation any longer, and God showed that 
by rending the veil that separated us. The cross of Jesus Christ from God's point of view is the central act of history. Everything flows from that. From that singular, great, earth-shattering event, all hope is flowing. All light is flaming. It is to that that all events must look for meaning. And this gives the point to what the author says next. That the results of this perfect sacrifice are being continually ministered to us in the proper sanctuary. Because he goes on to say in chapter 8 verse 1. Now this is the main point of the things we're saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens. A minister of the sanctuary and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man. For every high priest is appointed to offer both gifts and sacrifices. Therefore, it is necessary that this one also have something to offer. For if he were on earth, he would not be a priest. Since there are priests who offer the gifts according to the law, who serve the copy and shadow of the heavenly things, as Moses was divinely instructed when he was about to make the tabernacle. For he said, see that you make all things according to the pattern shown you on the mountain. Now, as the writer says, the point of emphasis in what he has been saying is not duration, but location. The question is, where is this kind of ministry of Jesus Christ available? Where do you find it? And he answers that it comes from the risen Christ who is at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in heaven, a minister of the true sanctuary which God made and not man. Now, if the picture you get from that is that we are poor, struggling mortals left here on planet Earth, and Christ is somewhere out in space in heaven. He's out there. Then you miss the entire point of the argument that the writer is making here. It is true, of course, that Jesus Christ is in heaven. But where's heaven? Well, heaven is not out there somewhere, remote in space. It's not some spatial location which can be pinpointed on Google Maps or on some other planet in some distant galaxy in the great reaches of space. There's no, there's no street view of it because the Google car drove by, you know? There's nothing like that. That's not what heaven is. Heaven is where God dwells. So heaven actually begins much closer than you think. In Luke 17, 21, Jesus told us that the kingdom of God is within you. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians 3.16 that you are the temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwells in you. That's why the veil was torn. Because through the sacrifice of Jesus Christ, there's no separation to, to the point that the most intimate of things happen. No longer is he separated behind a veil, but he chooses to dwell inside of you. You are the beginning of heaven. Not in some weird ethereal way, metaphysical way, but because that's simply where God's presence is. He has taken up residence in you. And God has designed a pattern for all of this. We're told that Moses built the tabernacle according to a pattern which was shown him when he ascended Mount Sinai to receive the law from the hand of God. He was given specific instructions. See that you make everything according to the pattern which was shown you on the mountain. The writer of Hebrews is quoting Exodus 25, 9. And when the tabernacle took form and shape under the, under the direction of Moses, it was a copy, though, of something else that Moses had already seen. He said, see that you follow the pattern. Well, what was the pattern? What was it a copy of? Well, the tabernacle, you remember, was built in three parts. There was a great outer court into which the people could come, but no Gentiles. There was a structure in the center of this court divided into two sections. One part was called the holy place, where were located certain articles of furniture for different purposes. And into that holy place, only the priests and the Levites could enter. The third part of the tab tabernacle was in the rear section of that structure, and it was called the holy of holies, containing in it nothing but the ark of the covenant of God, where dwelt the Shekinah glory, the glowing light that indicated the presence of God. And into that holy of holies, hidden behind the veil, entrance was prohibited to all upon pain of death, with the exception of the high priest who could enter once a year, and then only under the most rigid requirements involving the shedding of a sacrifice, the covering of blood. And all of this, was, though, was but a pattern, a shadow. It was a copy of the truth. And then that became the pattern for the temple. But the reality is, it's based on the pattern of heaven. We're given that view in other parts of Scripture. But Moses was shown all this. 
He saw the invisible realities of the nature of God, the structure of holy habitation, and the need for man to have a mediator, a way of access to this throne room. Mankind, in the uniqueness of his nature and structure, is designed to live in and with that access. Mankind and all of creation is the only part of creation that God has chosen to make his holy of holies, to enter in and dwell. And it's God's intention that we should have access to that inner world. The problem with that, well, we all know, it's sin. And that separation, the division that sin causes between us and God. But Jesus broke through that separation, that division for us, because God knew we couldn't. He broke through as the perfect high priest that offered the perfect sacrifice so that he is able to set man free in the area where he's been held in the greatest of bondage. Through him, we are now welcome. We are encouraged. We are ushered in behind the veil and in the most holy place because in God's design, we become the most holy place and his spirit moves from behind the veil to the realm of our own heart. What a precious thing that is. The cross. The work of Jesus is the gateway into the holy place. And we penetrate into the holy place only as we do so through the person and the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. Now in the next section, the writer begins to unfold to us the results of the sacrifice. The first part reveals the provision in the cross of a new approach for living. And there's a new approach that suggests, of course, that there must have been an old approach. And for a brief instant, the writer of Hebrews must look at the predicted failure of the law, the old approach. In chapter 8, verse 6 through 9, it says, But now he has obtained a more excellent ministry, inasmuch as he is also mediator of a better covenant, which was established on better promises. For if that first covenant had been faultless, then no place would have been sought for a second. Because finding fault with them, he says, Behold, the days are coming, says the Lord, when I will make a new covenant with the house of Israel and with the house of Judah. Not according to the covenant that I made with their fathers in the day when I took them by the hand and led them out of the land of Egypt. Because they did not continue in my covenant and I disregarded them, says the Lord. Now the law of Moses was the first covenant. We all know that. We've known that a long time. The law of Moses was the first covenant, the Ten Commandments. Now, there was nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. The reality is there's still nothing wrong with the Ten Commandments. The fault was with people. That's where the fault lied. God did not find fault with the law, but verse 8 says he finds fault with them, with the people, for they misunderstood the purpose of the law. Just the same (coughs) Excuse me, just the same as men and women all over the world today misunderstand the purpose of the Ten Commandments. The people of that day thought God wanted them to keep these Ten Commandments and that keeping them was the only way they could please God. They felt he demanded a rigid, careful, meticulous observance to the Ten Commandments. But what they did not understand though God pointed this out to them many times, was that God never expected that they would keep them and would obey them. He didn't expect they could do that because he knew they could not, that it was impossible to maintain perfection. He did not give the law to them to be kept, for he knew they could not keep it, which is why he made the provisions for sacrifice that would cover our breaking of the Ten Commandments. He did not give the law to them to be kept, for he knew they couldn't do it. He gave it to them to show that they could not keep it. To show them that they weren't perfect. So that they would then be ready to receive a Savior. But with presumptuous confidence, they tried to keep it. And when they could not, as of course God knew they could not, they just pretended to keep it. Much like we do today. And we are really good at pretending we're Christians. We are really good at pretending we are obeying God. But he set up a standard for us to have the contrast between perfection and who we are in our nature. And we set up a standard for ourselves. 
or we accept the standard of others around us and we honestly try to keep it but we cannot for fallen man simply cannot keep a moral law but rather than admit it just like them well we begin to cover it up we lower the requirements or we excuse our failure by saying well everybody does that or perhaps we argue that it's the intent to keep it that ought to be accepted or we promise to try harder And we excuse ourselves on our own imperfection. But that's what happened with Israel. They pretended to keep the law and deceived themselves. And so they sank lower and lower in the morass and gave themselves more and more ordinances and more and more laws to explain how they, in reality, were keeping the law in arrogant self-righteousness. And during one of their lowest of spiritual moments, when they had so sunk into the darkness of paganism surrounding them, where they had left their God and accepted such darkness that they were worshiping the filthy abominations of the heathen, even sacrificing their own children in utter depravity, when they were ready to be carried captive into Babylon, it was then God sent a prophet to them named Jeremiah. And through Jeremiah, he informed them of the covenant that was yet to come. This life had always been available to them by faith. But one day, God said, this new approach would be made evident to the nation by sight. And it's this approach that the writer of Hebrews turns to next. In chapter 8, verse 10 through 13, he says, For this is the covenant that I will make with the house of Israel. After those days, says the Lord, I will put my law in their mind and write them on their hearts. And I will be their God and they shall be my people. None of them shall teach his neighbor and none his brother, saying, Know the Lord, for all shall know me, from the least of them to the greatest of them. For I will be merciful to their unrighteousness, and their sins and their lawless deeds I will remember no more. In that he says a new covenant, he has made the first obsolete. Now what is becoming obsolete and growing old is ready to vanish away. Now when is a congregation, when is a congregation we celebrate communion together like we did last week, During the course of that time, we take bread and we break it and we all take some. And then we follow the bread with the cup. And using the words that Jesus used as he instituted this supper, he said, we say, this cup is the new covenant made with my blood. And Jesus speaks of this as a seal of the new covenant, the new approach, the new agreement, the new constitution, if you will, from which life, the life of all who know him, will be lived through the person of Jesus we have the work of Jesus and we have access to God as a result no earthly priest could take away sin the way Jesus did therefore Jesus's ministry is far better than the ministry of the priesthood under the law of Moses Jesus has mediated for us a better covenant a covenant of grace and not of works guaranteed for us by a co-signer with Jesus becoming the surety of this better covenant as we read in Hebrews 7:22. He did all of that <coughs> excuse me, he did all of that for us cuz we could not. It's a covenant marked by believing and receiving instead of by earning and deserving. There's no work we could do in our flesh that would earn us favor with God. The only work we can produce is death is what we're told. That's what comes. The works of the flesh are vile when you read the lists that Paul gives us of what they look like. But the gift of the Holy Spirit is life. The gift of the Holy Spirit is like what we were singing about earlier. Being white as snow. When the reality is our lives are as dark as could be. Jesus has mediated for us a better covenant. And it's a covenant marked by believing and receiving instead of by earning and deserving. Now, a mediator is one who stands in the middle between two people and brings them together. Moses was the mediator of the old covenant because he brought the two parties together. He stood between God and man. Jesus is the mediator of the new covenant, a better covenant standing between us and God the Father. But instead of the closed door, the veil of the old covenant, we have an open door in the new covenant which makes Jesus' covenant a far better covenant because we, individually, before God, have access to him. Better than any of the previous covenants God made with men. 
For there were others. The covenant of Jesus fulfills all the other covenants described in the Bible. It's better than the Abrahamic covenant, the Mosaic covenant, the Davidic covenant. It's better because it fulfills all of them, making those complete, not eradicating them, but completing them so that the new covenant can be eternal. These are promises to see us through the most desperate and dark of times. These are promises that become alive to us through the Spirit of God. These are promises of blessing and undeserved favor instead of promises to curse and to judge. This is a covenant or an agreement made between the Father and the Son. Do you realize that? It's made between the Father and the Son. It's not made between us and God. Not between Israel and God. It is wholly between the Father and the Son. But if any man be in Christ, everything in this covenant is open and available to him too. Someday we're told Israel as a nation will be in Christ. When they are, these words will be fulfilled for Israel as Jeremiah predicted. But right now, to Jew and Gentile alike, to any individual on the face of the earth who is willing to be in Christ, to let Christ live in him, this, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> this covenant and agreement is valid. Now, if you notice, there are four distinct provisions of the new covenant. God says, I will put my laws into their minds and write them on their hearts. He says, I will be their God and they shall be my people. He says, I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. He says, their sins and lawless deeds, I will remember no more. Notice what's not in those four provisions. There's no if clause. There's nothing that says, well, if, if they're good enough, I'll do this. Or if they earn enough brownie points with me, I'll do this. Or if they push the right buttons in prayer and claim the right things and bind the enemy in this way, then I'll do this. No, what it says is I will do this. I will be their God. I will put my law into their mind. I will write it on their heart. I will be their God. They shall be my people. I will be merciful to their unrighteousness. Their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. The only part we've got on that is unrighteousness, sin, and lawless deeds. Everything else is based on him. All things that God says he will do because he knows there's no way we can. What an answer to the search for identification, to the hunger to belong to someone. Here is the answer to the aching question of the human heart that says, who am I anyway? What can I identify with? God says, I will help you to know me. God says, you will be identified with me forever. I will be your God. You will be my people. God says, I will have mercy on you. God says, I will forget your sin. All we have to do is be in Christ. And that's it. The reality is that's everything the human heart longs for. God says, I will satisfy your life. You shall know me. This is the answer to the universal sense of condemnation that the reality is all humanity feels and holds. It answers the longing of the human heart that asks, where do I stand with God? God says if you are looking to the great high priest who is ministering to you all the effects of his sacrifice, then there is never a problem. And God says, I covenant that with to you with my own blood. For he has written it down in no uncertain words. In Romans 8, verse 1, it says, There is therefore now eh, a little bit of condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus because they're still sinful. No, what's it say? It says there is how much condemnation? There is no condemnation. And that Greek word for no, that's what it means. It means there is none. There is no, not a single trace of it there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in christ jesus none he says he is always for you he is never against you it does not mean he ignores iniquity or sin but he says i will be merciful toward it because of the person and the work of jesus christ which you can only understand when you see him both as the priest and the sacrifice the person and the work and when you acknowledge it there is no reproach there is no rehash he never gets historical on you he doesn't dredge up your past and like we tend to do with each other yeah you know i forgave you but you remember the other day when you did this we're really good at doing that with each other well god not so much there's one thing 
that an omniscient, all-knowing, ever-present God chooses to forget. What he chooses to forget is your sin. He said he cast it away as far as the east is from the west, and he remembers it no more. We have a hard time forgetting our own sin. I know I do. I think about it. It's like, oh, Lord, how could you love me? Look what I do over and over and over again. How I hurt your heart. But no, he doesn't dredge it up. Never gets historical. God never does that. Now, all of this is continuously available to us, and that's the joy of it. It is always available from within, ministered to us constantly, if we will have it. At the beginning of this chapter, the writer said, now this is the main point of the things we are saying. We have such a high priest who is seated at the right hand of the throne of the majesty in the heavens, a minister of the sanctuary, and of the true tabernacle which the Lord erected and not man which tells us that Jesus is absolutely all we need and is far superior to anything else we could ever anchor our hope and our faith in. Now, why is that his main point? Well, I think the why answers itself when we remember who these struggling believers were. We already went over it. They were Hebrew Christians being tormented and persecuted and pressured that their view was too narrow. Their view was too insufficient. Their view was too limited. That they needed to leave the doctrine that they had been given or they needed to change the doctrine they had been given. They needed to leave it and go back to Judaism or they needed to add Judaism on. So they needed to leave the doctrine or change the doctrine. And too much today in today's culture and society, that same pressure is true. All around we are being pressured to leave that which we have been given as a foundation, as an anchor, the doctrine we have in Scripture. Or we are being told that we must accept that which is contrary and adversarial to the reality of the Scriptures and accept bad and fruitless and warped theology of doctrine that is heralding all that is evil and sinful as good. It's the same lie that was foisted upon these Hebrew believers. And those who unlatch themselves from the one true anchor we have, well, they're going to drift away and become shipwrecked. That's what we were told here. We have an anchor. And in that, our hope and our faith rests. Now, the reality is that nothing has changed in that eternal new covenant that we have from our God. Nothing's changed in it. The anchor hasn't changed. The foundation has not changed. God's word has not been shaken. In it we can rest and have hope. In it we can rely upon the truth of it. The person and the work of Jesus Christ was and is and ever will be everything and all that we need. And it is true that the main point is still Jesus Christ. Lord, thank you. Thank you for your word. God, may we stand unshaken by the circumstance of culture around us. But may we not fall into the danger with the warning that you've given us that when lawlessness abounds, the love of many will grow cold. For we could look at these things and our hearts can become calloused. We could look at these things and we could see people as our enemy. We could look at these things and we could see all kinds of unfruitful responses but oh lord may we hold on to you as our anchor as our foundation as our hope so that we could walk through these times with joy and with love and so that you would be what's overflowing from us as we allow you to fulfill all that you promised in this wonderful new covenant that you have given us may we hold on to the person and the work of Jesus Christ. May we hold on to our great high priest and that perfect holy sacrifice. May we become more like you. Oh, how we need you, Lord. Fill us with your spirit, and may we walk in your ways. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. You guys want to stand with me for the last song?